I'm Christian Sandvig, by the way. I am one of the co-organizers of the event, along with Professor Kara Karahelios. Um, today's speaker is Esther Hargitay, and she joins us from Northwestern University. Um, some facts about Esther. First of all, she's an associate professor of communication studies there. She's also appointed at the Institute for Policy Research, and she's also a fellow of the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. Um, I met Esther uh, several years ago at the International Communication Association, where I was pleased to see her on a panel celebrating winners of paper awards, which she won. Uh, and she's gone on to win many more. I note from her uh, CV and her work um, that she's won uh, best paper awards from the American Sociological Association, the Eastern Sociological Society, uh, a number of communication associations. She's won awards on work related to telecommunications policy. And last year, she was selected by the International Communication Association as its outstanding young scholar internationally. Um, she's also the editor of the recent book, Research Confidential, Solutions to Problems Most Social Scientists Pretend They Never Have. Um, she directs uh, the Web Use Project at Northwestern University, and she writes an academic career advice column for inside higher education called PhD. Uh, this really, I mean, it's such an exciting thing for me to have Esther here, and I hope you'll join me in welcoming her um, to speak on the topic, digital natives or digital naives. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Christian, and thanks, Carrie, for having me. I'm really honored to be part of this exciting speaker series, and thanks, everyone, for coming out. So as Christian mentioned, I will be talking about this question, well, are they digital natives or are they digital naives? So what do I mean by that? Well, actually, before I get into that, let me, uh, let me tell you where I am on the spectrum of academic disciplines, because I know that this is an interdisciplinary crowd, so perhaps some of you have seen this cartoon from XKCD, but um, I just, since I know that there are people from different fields in the, in the audience, I thought I'd situate myself in the spectrum of fields, and so I'm all the way here, and that means that we do really messy things. That's the way I interpret this, this graph, so it's not really a graph figure. So um, <clears throat> at times, in case you wonder, where is she coming from? Well, you know that we do the really messy stuff over here. But we still think we have very interesting findings. In fact, I think we think we have interesting findings because we're willing to get pretty messy with the data. OK, so what about this idea of digital natives versus digital naives? So some of you may have heard these terms, digital natives. And the idea is that people who were born fairly recently, last 20 years, uh, grew up with digital media, and so inherently, because they've had digital media in their lives um, ever since they were born, they're inherently more savvy and comfortable with digital media. That's the assumption. As opposed to people like me and some of us in the room who are <coughs> digital immigrants because we didn't grow up with digital media. And so what's interesting about this assumption is that <coughs> when it comes to general public rhetoric, there seems to be a lot of agreement among people of all ages that this is the case. Um, and so this is what these assumptions look like uh, when you hear about this, sort of, again, just in public discussions. Uh, it seems as though these four um, characteristics of these so-called digital natives are, can be taken for granted. But in fact, what I will be showing you today is that we can't really take this for granted. And a lot of these assumptions that are out there are not based on any empirical evidence whatsoever. Um, someone came up with these terms. They sound really neat. Uh, but people who talk about, use these terms a lot, um, don't really have much evidence to back up these claims. So uh, instead, I'll be showing you through uh, data um, that, in fact, while some of these assumptions are close to true, some of them are not at all. And that, in fact, uh, people who are often thought of as digital natives are um, sometimes, or some of them, are, in fact, quite naive with respect to digital technologies. So let me back up a little bit um, to give a larger framework. So the internet's been around for a while now, right? Uh, and what's interesting is that, and a good thing, is that we still have a lot of enthusiasm about the web and digital media and social media uh, because we assume that it can help us um, do all these things and improve our lives in these various ways. What's really fascinating um, 
is that at the same time, while there's much enthusiasm about all this, there's also a lot of anxiety related to very similar issues, which is that instead of disseminating information, in fact, it's disseminating misinformation, that instead of connecting people, some people are really concerned that if anything, it's disconnecting us. Um, and that while, yes, it has participation, it's not allowing it for everybody. And that, in fact, keeping track of our data, well, that's not just us, but the government and businesses as well. And so that's a problem. And so what's interesting is that on the one hand, we have this a lot of enthusiasm. So that's the, the happy view of the internet. And then on the other hand, we have all this anxiety. And that's the sad view. Um, but what's, what's fascinating to me is that we've, for 15 years now, right, we've had the internet as a mass diffused medium. And even 15 years into this, there's still very much this dichotomy of the internet is all good or the internet is all bad. So I am basically advocating against that view with the idea that it really depends on the social circumstances, social context as to whether the internet is going to have positive or negative implications in various specific uh, scenarios. Conveniently, smiley faces, in fact, create a Venn diagram. And so really, the question is, what is it that's in between there somewhere? So think of it that way. What is it that happens that might be good, might be bad, but it really depends on the circumstances? So that's a way to think about, I think, a more productive way to think about the social implications of digital and social media. So for me in particular, my central research question for years has been, who are the people who are most well positioned to benefit from the internet? And <clears throat> sociologically speaking, there are these two opposing potential theoretical, um, or two theoretical approaches uh, that one can apply here. One is that this idea of social mobility where uh, people are in a certain uh, situation in society, but thanks to this new opportunity, new resource, they can actually improve their life chances. So that, that would be one possibility, one possible outcome of using digital media. Another would be what's called social reproduction, that people are in certain situations, and in fact, uh, whatever um, context may be, whatever may be going on, um, they actually just reproduce whatever position they were in. So um, whatever position their parents were in in society is what they're going to be in. So these are two opposing views. And so the question is, how does digital media, how do information communication technologies um, play into all this? And um, my argument is that this isn't just about getting connected, right? So there's the question of digital divide. And yes, a quarter of Americans are not even online yet, which is certainly uh, an important issue and something we need to, to, uh, to still talk about. And, and think about and act upon. But my concern is that even after many people get connected, that does not mean that they're going to be efficient use users per se. And it's going to depend on their social context and how they implement and how they um, adopt the technology uh, and use it in their everyday lives that will influence uh, whether they can, in, in fact, benefit from it. So let's think about possible outcomes that might happen with respect to socioeconomic status in particular. So one scenario is that over time, people from all uh, socioeconomic uh, status segments would improve their chances, uh, life chances, in that um, thanks to digital media, both those from higher SES and those from lower SES uh, improve and get in a better, better position. But in fact, when it comes to their relative relationships with each other, they're sort of in the same place because they've both improved. Another possible outcome is that those who are in lower socioeconomic status positions are actually able to use digital media to uh, improve their position so much that they actually catch up with those who are be better positioned than they are. But yet another possible outcome is that, in fact, it's those who are already more privileged in society who are really taking advantage of digital media. And so they get even further ahead, whereas those who are from uh, less privileged backgrounds are not able to incorporate digital media, social media into their lives in helpful ways as much. And thus, the gap between those from lower and those in higher socioeconomic positions actually widens. So these are possible outcomes, and it's an empirical question as to what happens in the end. Now, you should note an interesting little assumption in this graph. In all scenarios, those lines are moving up. It is actually possible that the, lies, that the lines stay, um, uh, stay in the same 
position with respect to opportunities as in there are none. Or some might even argue that, in fact, things become even worse. And so the, the lines could even be sloping downward. I'm just making this assumption uh, for the sake of argument. I believe that there are definitely potential opportunities of social media, digital media, um, but could be, uh, it could actually, I just wanted to point out that there is that little assumption in this graph. So the overall framework I use in my work, again, is I start out with the user, right? So I'm interested in those who are users, and I consciously think about who is that person? What's their gender? What's their socioeconomic status? What's their education? What's their age? Um, what's their race? What's their ethnicity? And then I also think about the context of their uses. How much autonomy do they have in using the internet, both socially and technically speaking? Do they have access to the latest gadgets? Are they accessing um, media, digital media through outdated devices and software? Um, how many people are there in ne their networks whom they can draw on uh, when they have questions? Uh, so all those things are things to consider. And then what I've argued especially in my work is that all these things to contribute to what I call skill, internet abilities, uh, efficient, effective ways of using the medium. And that this relates to people. And so the question is, the <coughs> what does this depend on? And also, does skill then relate to how people actually make use of digital media, both in terms of what types of information they seek and consult, but also to what extent are they contributing to content that's out there? And then the really big question ultimately is how all these things feed back into people's life chances. So this is what I was talking about earlier. So does use of the internet ultimately matter? One way that it would matter is that people are actually, say, improving their life chances, improving their academic achievement, improving their chances of getting a good job. So those are all empirical questions ahead of us. And my goal is to answer at least some of them today. And as I said, skill is something I've really focused on in my work. And so I will be focusing on that quite a bit today. So to recap the main questions I'm asking today, do people's skills differ in using the internet? And again, think back digital natives. There's this very prevalent rhetoric that in fact, if you're young, you're savvy. So the answer to those people would be no, all of them are super savvy. So this is still a relevant question to ask. If we do find that people's skills differ, then how can we explain those differences? Are they random or are they related systematically to some characteristic? Are skills related to how people use the internet? Is there some connection there? And then ultimately, what are the implications of differentiated social media uses? OK, so what data do we rely on if we, study, if we want to study internet skill? So now I'm going to s spend the next few minutes and a few slides on the methods associated with my project. And I know that it's not always that common to spend time on the methods uh, of data collection in this kind of a presentation. But given that I'm partly critiquing certain people for not having any empirical evidence, I think it's only fair that I tell you where my empirical evidence comes from. I also want to make some comments uh, with respect to data collection in this realm and research methods, uh, especially since I know that there are lots of students in the audience as well. Um, OK, so when it comes to data on internet uses, we have tons, right? Websites log all our movements online, and there is lots of data being generated. So what's the big deal? Well, the issue is that it's one thing to have lots of data on internet uses. It's a different matter to have helpful data on the average internet user. And so in fact, we don't have that much data of this sort that's comparable across different data sets and um, different contexts. And <coughs> part of this has to do with lack of established terms, lack of established understandings of different uh, data sources. It's definitely a moving target. But I, overall, I call this the digital data paradox. So on the one hand, we have all this information that's being generated every second of the day about people's uh, footprints out there. But on the other hand, it's really hard for us to know what to do with it if we're interested in the average user. Because there's tons of data being generated about the super active online users, and much less about those who don't go online that much. And if you're also interested in those people who are not necessarily on every website out there, then it's much harder to get data about them. I also wanted to address uh, this issue of relying on 
log data to do analyses of people's internet uses. So what do I mean by log data? So log data refer to data that are automatically generated on various services that people use. So again, it could be Google creating logs of all the searches that people are running on it, or Facebook keeping track of when people are posting comments and status updates, or any of those uh, many, many types of actions online that we engage in that generate data for someone out there, usually these companies. Um, the thing is, though, that becoming the user of a service is not a random event. And that's actually itself an empirical question, but I will be addressing it um, with some data. But the, the point is that it's, it's not like every website out there is randomly picked up and used by people. Uh, that's usually tech-savvy people who spend a lot of time online are more likely to adopt websites earlier than lots of other people out there. So if you're relying solely on data from one website to make conclusions about internet users out there as a whole, you're biasing towards the types of people who are more likely to use that site that is the basis of your study. So that's one problem. Another is that people understand and use sites and services differently. So for example, people will go on Facebook. Some people will use Facebook to interact with just their friends, but absolutely do not use it to interact with their family. And so then people publish a study off of Facebook data. Oh, people don't hang out with their family anymore. Well, that's just they don't hang out with their family on Facebook, but you don't know where else people might be interacting with their family. So that's, uh, that's just one example of why it's problematic to rely only on log data especially from one site, which is what those types of studies tend to do. And then the other issue is that things people do on one website is usually just one of, the, one of many types of interactions, for example, that they have with others in their network. So for example, yes, I may exchange a few messages with a friend on Facebook, but in fact, it turns out that most of our communication is through text messaging. So if you do a study and you're trying to map my network of, and the intensity of my friendship network, just through my actions on Facebook, you're missing out entirely on everything I do on every other platform out there. So again, this is why it's very problematic to rely just on one data source of that sort. So what have I done to address the shortcomings of log data? So what I tend to do is um, rely on sampling methods that, don't, that aren't about internet uses, per se. So I'll get back to that in a sec. Actually, let me um, say a few words about this uh, study that I did years ago where I brought people in. But in fact, even here, I used traditional random sampling. I had the names. I, I got the names of a random sample of Mercer County, New Jersey residents. And I called them up and asked them to participate in this study. And so they came into the lab. But again, I got the names not through some internet site. I just, I just got their names from traditional uh, sampling methods. Yes, they had phones, but since I was only interested in internet users, um, that was not so much of a problem. And what I had was I asked them to come into the lab and I asked them to look for different types of content, and um, there were a hundred of these people, and then looked at how long they d took to perform different tasks that I asked them to do. So it was a, a type of measure of skill, right? Can you find different types of content? It was an information seeking study. And so this graph may look complicated. It's basically just charting how long it took different people to go through the tasks. And it just it's a cumulative distribution function of just where people um, were on the uh, distribution of time that it took to finish the entire task. So it just shows that uh, about a quarter of them were done in about 14 minutes, and the slowest people took over 40. What I did, the reason I mentioned this, this is really not the study I want to talk about today. The reason I mentioned this is that I used this study of people's actual skills, so where I actually sat with them and was able to measure how well they look for information. Um, I used this study then to develop survey measures of skill that would be generalizable, that would be uh, skill uh, measures that I could administer on instruments that could be uh, uh, applied to much larger samples. So the issue is, it's really rich data to meet with people one-on-one, -on -one, but it's also extremely expensive and time-intensive and labor-intensive, so it's, it, doesn't, it really doesn't scale. Um, whereas having survey questions uh, is scalable. So I wanted to mention this so you understand where my scale measures came from. Okay, so this question, do people's skills differ using the internet? So I, I, I'm 
going to spend just a couple of slides just so you see the measure of skill that I'm using. And it's just one measure. I have published already three papers on it, so I've thought about this a lot. But in Q&A, feel free to ask me about it. Um, but the idea is that I was asking people to uh, rate their level of understanding of 27 different items. And that was how I created a variable of skill, <coughs> awareness, understanding variable measure. Um, which it turns out, <coughs> excuse me, is less prone to certain biases than if you simply ask people what they think their skill is. Excuse me. <coughs> okay, so in an ideal world, I'd have data on a nationally representative sample of internet users. But I haven't managed to have the resources to do that. So what I've been doing over the past few years is focusing in on a very particular population. Um, and it's the University of Illinois, Chicago. And the reason this is particularly relevant, okay, so why UIC? Well, for those of you not familiar with the Chicago area, it's not, it's not the most convenient place for me to do a study. Obviously, most convenient would have been to study Northwestern students. Um, there are lots of other campuses in between. I opted for, oh, and we collect data in the winter, which actually matters because that makes it rather inconvenient, especially for my RAs. But, um, that's because we collect the data in person. Um, but the reason I went with UIC is that it's one of the most ethnically and racially diverse campuses uh, in the country. And given that I'm interested in questions of race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status differences, this was a great uh, population for me to study. Focusing in on young adults because of these assumptions that they are inherently savvy having grown up with digital media. So it's a very interesting population to study from that perspective. Um, there's one more thing that made UIC a really great place for the study. They actually have a course that's required of all of their first year students. So that way I'm not biasing towards students who might have for one reason or another decided to enroll in a certain course. All of them have to take this one course that has graciously uh, worked with me on this project. We have been conducting a paper pencil survey. Now talk about inconvenient in the digital age. Right? So we have samples of over 1,000 for several years, and that's a lot of work going down 20 miles from Evanston. If you think all we had to do is walk into a classroom of 1,000 students, I wish, but they have these courses, 20 students each. So we walked into more than 80. Um, so it's quite, it's quite a production, in fact. And these are the data sets that we've collected over the years. Um, so um, I'll mo mainly be talking about the data from 09 today. I just wanted to mention we also have some data from 07 from a different cohort. And then very exciting that we also have for the 09 sample a follow-up study that uh, we did this past spring for with the same people. And the reason it says young adults and not sophomores is that some of them have in fact by then left college. So um, we were able to track uh, people regardless of whether they stayed at UIC. So about 10% had already left UIC by their second year. And in fact, UIC graduates, I think, less than 50% within six years. So don't think of these students as all college graduates. So in fact, it's quite a diverse sample. Um, about half of them are first generation college, less than half are white. So we, we really do have a nice diverse sample here. So that's exciting. That said, in fact, it's still not as diverse as the US population because they did go to college at least for one year. So that's something to keep in mind. They are, of course, we are controlling for age and education. Um, but if anything, that means that if we have certain findings, our findings are going to be conservative if you apply it to a more broadly diverse sample on age and education. But so that's just something to keep in mind. So as I said, the first couple of assumptions about uh, digital natives are are true, uh, they're right on. It is in fact the case that they've been online for many years, they spend a lot of time online. Um, and in fact, they still check email, which some people suggest they don't, but they do. They don't if the email is from a professor and they don't care to know what the professor is saying, but that's a different matter. Um, so with respect to these skill awareness understanding measures, clearly there's a distribution, uh, well, that's from the, the little square box on top. Um, so there are certain terms that people understand very well. This was a rating of one through five. And so I'm showing you the averages for the 
1,115 students in 2009, <coughs> but there are terms that many of them don't understand. Just to give you an example, for some of these terms, we're also following up with multiple choice questions to get at the actual knowledge. So for example, with BCC, sometimes people say, um, so in my research, I try to react, very much react to feedback I get. And so over the years, people have said, oh, well, maybe they just don't understand what the B and the C and the C stand for, but they get the general idea. And so I thought, okay, well, let me test for that. It's an empirical question. And uh, so what I did was in the 2010 survey, I actually had a multiple choice uh, question that was in no way a trick question. It had an explanation of what BCC is and three other things that have absolutely nothing to do with what it is. And um, a third of them picked with those other things. So even on a multiple choice question where we really are getting at that actual knowledge, people are not getting this right. So there are also things to think about with respect to the fact that students don't, that this many students don't actually understand the whole concept of BCC. So in terms of advanced internet related skills, we have even more variation with respect to understanding. And so what I did was I create a, a general average score of, average, an index score of these measures. Everybody gets a score of how they responded to these or how they rated their skill for these 27 items. And so as I said, I'm interested in whether there is some relationship to people's background and how they understand the internet. And so what I found was large gender variation in terms of people's self-reported understanding. And gender has emerged as a fascinating variable in these series of studies. And I'll keep coming back to it because I think it's quite complex. Um, also found that there is difference by race and ethnicity in terms of people's understanding of internet terms. And we also find it by socioeconomic status. The so uh, parental education is what is the proxy for socioeconomic status. But overall, summing up these three uh, figures that I just showed you, basically what we find is if you take the average Hispanic female student in the sample whose, uh, whose parents have low levels of education, so who's from a lower socioeconomic status uh, background, that's her score, and if you take the average what uh, average Asian male student who comes from a high SES family, that's his score. And so that's quite a large difference in terms of skill. And so we can't really claim that they all are super savvy when this is the level of variation that we find among them. Okay, so if we find this level of variation just for one sample, what would it look like if we had a national sample? Well, I told you I didn't have money to run it nationally, but fortunately, I did manage to convince the Federal Communications Commission to include some of my skill measures on a broadband survey that they did in fall of 09. And so I'm able to look at what we actually find for a nationally representative sample for a subset of my measures. So they didn't have the 27 items, they had six. Um, but basically, so I didn't have data on income, so let's see what the in income data show us. And yes, nationally speaking, if you have higher income, you have higher skills. They have education variation, which I didn't have. And yes, if you have higher education, you have higher skills. And I looked at age, because they have age variation in, the, in that data set. And if we look at people 50 and under, basically there's no relationship with skill whatsoever. It's really over 50 that you start seeing a sharp drop off in level of understanding of these skills. But 50 and under, it's pretty much uh, similar levels. So again, this is yet another um, empirical, a piece of empirical evidence that in fact there's not really these digital natives as opposed to digital immigrants um, en masse. That there are these other factors in fact that matter quite a bit when it comes to skill. And those, the FCC data are publicly available if anyone wanted to run those numbers. Okay, so how are skills related to differentiated uses? Well, as I said, I'll, I'll come back to gender a few times in the talk. And um, Stephen Schaefer and I wrote a paper uh, from some of my dissertation data, which was about observing people's actual skills. And what was interesting was that we found that even when men and di women in their actual skills were quite similar, women would still rate their skills lower than men. So either men are overestimating their skills, women are underestimating their skills, or both. 
So you'd think, okay, well, women are skilled, they just don't think so, so is that really an issue then? Well, we hypothesize that thinking that you're not as skilled might still have repercussions. And so that's something I'll come back and look at with some data um, as I move forward with the presentation. But I wanted to show you this graph because I think this, or a cartoon from another XKCD brilliance. I love this cartoon. Um, I think it says so much. And I'm going to explain it because I've been in audiences where it turns out people didn't really get it. So I'll just say a few words. But the, the idea is that if a... Uh, if, uh, uh, if, uh, man doesn't get something right with math, then it's personally just his inability to have gotten that right or wrong. Um, if it's a woman who messes up with something in math, then it's her entire gender that is incompetent with math. And so, of course, you didn't get it right because women just can't do this. So the idea of this cartoon is just showing the stereotype that we live in in a lot of situations and that there is a lot of this stereotype out there about genders and their differentiated abilities when it comes to math, science, or it could be technologies. And so that's what this cartoon is capturing, I think, very, very nicely. And so I bring this up because I think this may be partly what's going on with some of the findings that I've uh, had in the studies. And we're actually now starting to do, I've never used experimental design, but we're starting to now to see whether we can get at some of what's going on here. Um, because I find this a huge puzzle and a fascinating one, but somewhat troubling one. Um, so question of what do people do online, internet uses. So obviously, the, with respect to sort of core percentages of how many people do different things, you could say, well, this is now data that are almost two years old. And is that really still relevant? Well, first of all, things don't usually change quite as much as people perceive them to change. Um, there's a lot of stability across the different years about the different uh, data bits and pieces. But really what's of interest here, in fact, especially is the relationships of uh, different variables, which especially uh, will hold over time. So there are these three sides that most of the sample uh, reports using. But what's interesting is a lot of these other sites on the slide are things that you hear about a lot in the media and are hyped up as things that everyone's using. And if anyone's going to be using them, it would be the young, because remember, they're digital natives. They do everything. Um, OK, so but in fact, the reality is that a lot of these things very few uh, people in the sample use. And in fact, um, a lot of these numbers are very consistent with the 07 data that were a different cohort, uh, but also first years at that time. One of the things I showed for data <coughs> about race, racial, ethnic um, likelihood of using MySpace versus Facebook is that there are big differences in who selects into which one of these sites. And in fact, this was very consistent from data from 07 from a different cohort then. And what was interesting was I'd shown this in 07, and people said, oh, but by next year, it's all going to be the same. And not really, right? So yes, I mean, if you have a site like Facebook where almost everybody's using it, of course, then you don't have differences anymore. But otherwise, it was interesting to see that those differences persisted over time. Another thing that's interesting, and I, I make this note just to, for those of you who are, who are skeptical that I have just this very specific population and what does this really say about the rest of the nation. So when in 07 I published the paper about the racial, ethnic, socioeconomic differences in who uses MySpace and Facebook. I tried to get some press for it. And the Chronicle of Higher Education covered it, but other places said, oh, well, what is this one campus? We don't care. What's interesting is that two years later, Nielsen came out with the exact same findings. And then the press covered it, because that was national sample. But the reality is that they were completely replicating my findings from two years prior. So I just, I just point this out as suggesting that the data are actually more generalizable than they might first appear. Um, OK, so one of the statistics that you might have noticed on the previous slide was that Twitter was at 4% for 09. And you might have thought, oh, but Twitter, Twitter, everybody uses Twitter by 10. So let's see. OK, so in the UIC sample, 18% of the students said that they were using Twitter. And really, the question was, um, the, the answer options were, uh, no, have never used it, tried it once, never used it again, used it in the past, not now, use it sometimes, use it often. And basically, 18% are the ones who said use it sometimes or use it often currently. Um, 
And what's interesting uh, from a different study from Northwestern seniors, here are a couple of quotes that I thought were interesting because, again, they're Northwestern students, they're privileged, they're seniors, they're digital natives, but oops, they have no idea why they would use Twitter. So there you go. That's just sort of another more qualitative evidence of how just because you're young doesn't mean that you're using everything that's out there uh, or that you get it. A little bit more information on this. Um, with my student Eden Lit, we have a paper coming out in New Media and Society where we look at use of Twitter in this data set. So one of the things we found, and this is consistent with other people's data, that African Americans are much more likely to use Twitter than others. Um, what's really neat about our data is that we have longitudinal data now for this population, right? So we have information on people for 2009, all sorts of data on 2009, and then for the same people, we know whether in 2010 they use Twitter. And so what we can do is we can predict statistically what explains, what 2009 characteristics, characteristics explain use of Twitter in 2010. So what we find, as you saw, African Americans are more likely to use Twitter, and also, what skill you had in 09 is a predictor of whether you're a user in Twitter. So I'm bringing skill back in. What's also interesting is we had data in 2009 <coughs> for topics in which people are interested. More, that's actually, let me rephrase that. Your level of interest in different topics. So we asked people, what's your level of interest in? Politics, in sports, in technology, in news, in entertainment and celebrity news. And so we thought, well, let's see how that relates to adoption of Twitter, especially since we know from certain studies what types of topics are popular on Twitter, like sports, like celebrities. And what we found was that, in fact, the main predictor of whether you adopted Twitter by 2010 is that you're really interested in entertainment and celebrity news. In fact, that's so important that it takes away the effect of uh, African Americans. So, Basically, what's really going on is African Americans report being more interested in entertainment and celebrity news than others, and that's actually what's driving Twitter adoption. Uh, curiously, we found that an interest in science and research negatively relates to uh, Twitter adoption, and for this particular age group, there's no relationship with, between technology interest, politics interest, and Twitter adoption. Now, again, here I want to emphasize that this is for a very particular age group, and we know that Twitter is actually more popular in some older groups, so it may be that for older cohorts, politics is actually, uh, may actually be a predictor of Twitter adoption. But in this particular case, um, that's not what's going on for this population. So this is exciting because while peop others have also found differences by race, ethnicity of adoption of different sites, no one's been able to explain that away. And so we're able to do that here with the data, so that's pretty exciting. And, th and th thanks to the longitudinal nature of the data. Okay, so one more interest uh, uh, it here is who's participating, right? So one of the big excitements around social media is that it's, you're no longer just a passive consumer, but you're actually contributing your own content out there. You're contributing to conversations yourself. So again, empirical question, well, who's actually doing that? How much are people really doing this? So one question, or we had a series of questions on the survey having to do with these different types of content creation activities, and just to clarify this whole idea of creating a quiz, probably the way respondents understood that was something like Facebook quizzes, right? So don't think real elaborate class quizzes kind of thing. So these are the percentages that reported ever having done this in the past years, right? So an incredibly low threshold of participation. Like, have you just once voted on something, on a review or something? And none of them have been, uh, none of them are things that over half of the people have reported doing. So again, reality check. It's not like everyone's doing this stuff. What's also fascinating, oh, so you might be wondering, well, how is she, how is she ordering these? These are not even in order of uh, popularity, and you don't know this, but I like to order things. So why is she ordering it this way? Well, um, I'm ordering it this way because I've ordered it by gender variation. So 
from top to bottom, the top activities are ones that men and women report engaging in at very similar levels. Whereas if you get down to the last one, look at the huge difference, 29% of male uh, students versus 8% of female students report having edited or changed, um, added to Wikipedia entry. That's a huge difference by gender. The only thing that women report having done more is changing their privacy settings on their Facebook accounts. <laughs> And in fact, I should add that by 2010, and I have a paper with Dana Boyd on this, by t 2010, um, pretty much everyone's changed their Facebook privacy settings. So by then, there's actually not much variation. What I did was I, s I created a summary variable. So how many of these activities did you participate in? And so again, reality check, a quarter of the students haven't done any of these things in the past year. Again, these are the so-called digital natives. Um, so then, Back to this idea, well, is there any systematic relationship between your background and how much you're contributing? We see that women contribute less. We also see differences in contribution by race and ethnicity and by socioeconomic status. So again, bringing all those together, if you take the average Hispanic female from a low SES background, she will have engaged in just one of those activities uh, of those five, if you take the average white male from a high SES background, he will have done three of them. That's a gigantic difference, right? That's a huge difference on a, one to, on a zero to five scale. And then, okay, so how does skill play into all this? Well, there is a large skill variation too. So those who are in the lowest quartile on the skill score will have done less than one of those things, and those who are in the highest quartile will have done almost three. So skill matters. A paper that I did with Gina Waleko, we showed that men were more likely to share things like video and ma uh, music publicly, uh, actually privately or publicly. Uh, what was interesting was that when we controlled for the skill measure that I've been talking to you about, this idea of what's your self-rated, right? This isn't actual measure. This is that self-rated skill measure. When we controlled for that, the gender relationship went away. So if you take a male and a female student who claim, who rate themselves similarly on skill, they're sharing at similar levels. And so this is why, where I come back to that idea that even if it's in just in your head or whether it's actual or perceived, it seems to matter. And so uh, that's just something important to consider. Just a few more uh, tidbits that I think are interesting from 2010. Um, so just, I think, helps with knowing that the data are probably um, valid because most people say that they watch videos on YouTube. That's not shocking. But what's interesting, again, is the large gender variation. Now we have more detail about, so I asked in 2010, well, what exactly are they doing on YouTube? And so it's, it's just fascinating just how much more men are saying that they're posting videos and commenting on them and voting, them, uh, voting on them. Here we don't see that much variation by race, ethnicity, um, just a little bit by socioeconomic status. With respect to Wikipedia, I have um, a, a study with Erica mentioned Trevino um, where we looked at uh, Wikipedia use not through survey work, this was actually observational interview data, where we found that some students definitely understand Wikipedia use, but some really don't. So. Um, it's important to, to think about this as well. And so partly what I'm trying to do again with the, the methods is trying to come up with survey questions that we can then apply to larger samples. And so in one current survey question, I ask about how people in understand how Wikipedia functions. And so through that, I, I was able to find that 30% believe that Wikipedia is edited by official editors, which is an interesting reality check again. So uh, just another realm to think about skill, and here to <coughs> enormous differences in, uh, by gender in terms of who's contributing. One thing you might be thinking about is, well, so what is this you're asking about the internet? Like, is the issue that people are accessing the internet through mobile? Is that included here? So I just wanted to say a few words about mobile. So it is the case that most, almost everybody in the sample has a mobile device. Um, and while they do some, almost everybody uses it for some things like texting, it turns out that many don't use it for something like accessing the web. And it's not shocking because actually having a data plan on your phone is not that cheap when you're 18 and 
you, you come from a family where um, people, uh, the, where your parents have jobs, but you just don't have much discretionary income. Uh, and in fact, in a paper with Su Jung Kim, we found that um, the people, the students most likely to have web-enabled phones are the ones who already have more locations to access the web anyway. So instead of being a replacement uh, feature, it's a function, it's more that it's just one more place for those who already have lots of places to access the web. Okay, so why is it helpful to focus on skill? Well, while it may be that we, you know, it'd be great if we could improve people's socioeconomic status, that's a, that's a pretty big uh, challenge and goal. But in the meantime, um, skill is something that, it, that is something we can intervene on, I think, in a much more reasonable way than changing people's uh, socioeconomic status, per se. So it seems like a way th that skill is something that um, we can try to help people improve. And I've hopefully I've shown convincingly that it matters to how people are using the internet. And so it's important that if we really want to have uh, uh, social media that truly everybody is in participating in not, and not just uh, a place for the already privileged to have yet one more place to uh, voice their concerns and viewpoints, then we, we need to make sure that we're not taking for granted that everybody out there, regardless of age, is super skilled and that we are actually um, making sure that people are more skilled. So um, one way to take away this message is some of you might recall that in 2006, Time came out with person of the year as you, but the message I want you to take away from here that it's really not you, the general you, but it's more like some of you or more like some of us in this room. So that's one way to think about it. And I just want to thank my funders and my students, and I want to thank you for, uh, for the time. And I think now we have some time to open it up for questions. So yes. Great, so I'm, I've been asked to repeat the questions because uh, we don't have a roaming microphone. So just uh, briefly, the question was, yes, um, there are differences in not everybody has access, but presumably more people have access now than they did with traditional media, so isn't that better anyway? Um, and that's a very legitimate question. Um, and I think uh, th there are a few things to keep in mind there. One is, so I completely agree. Chances are that, yes, we're hearing more voices. But it's, it's complicated, actually, um, at all sorts of levels. Uh, with respect to, for example, blogging, I mean, it's been shown that really there are a few bloggers who get a lot of attention and a lot of bloggers who get almost no attention. And so when we look at just those few who get a lot, is that really that much more than journalists traditionally? I'm not sure. And, and again, moving target, hard to measure. But um, so th that's one issue. Another issue is that I think we just need to stay conscious of the fact that it's not an equally distributed new resource. And if it's just the more privileged whose voices are being heard more, then in fact, to certain segments of society, I would argue it's not necessarily better. Because if the assumption is precisely this, but anyway, more people are participating, but there are certain segments of society where in fact that's not even the case, then we're walking away with the wrong conclusion, which is, oh, but more people are participating. I think you can conclude that for certain segments of society, and I don't think we have the evidence to conclude that for other segments of society. So that's why I think it does remain a concern. But again, just to be fair, I did have slopes going all up, right? So I do, I mean, I'm all with the potential benefits. I just think we need to be very careful about who that generalizes to. Yes?
Sure. So that that's uh, look, so the question was uh, at what point is this more about preference rather than skill, um, which is another very good question. Uh, although it's interesting because you mentioned you know some people just like to talk more a lot. The stereotype would be that it's women who like to talk more a lot. So in fact, the stereotype of who likes to talk a lot doesn't match what we're finding here, which is that men are actually much more likely to be commenting on videos. So, and want to be heard. Yeah, I mean, I think, that, I think there's, a lot, there's a lot going on here. And one of the things, I mean, this is a big audience, so I didn't do the exercise that I sometimes do with this slide. Um, which is I asked the audience to think about, before seeing those numbers, you know, how did I rank these? Why is, it rate, why is it in this order? And people come up with things like, well, you know, the, the ones there are more, um, like the ones on the bottom are like, you're putting out your opinion for everybody to hear, whereas the others are not so much that. Or, um, which is interesting because if that's the case, for example, with Wikipedia entries, it is one of those cases where, well, yeah, so who thinks that their voice is worthy of everybody to hear? Um, is that a preference or is that socialization that women feel that their voice is not worthy of people to hear, right? So there's a question there. And I think there's a lot of socialization going on there for sure. And I, I think in that sense, no, it's not that different from previous uh, uh, dynamics necessarily at all, right? We know, for example, um, in, I think, there's been research done in academia that um, women who receive critiques from reviewers on their articles very much take it, internalize it and say, oh, gosh, I messed up. I'm not sending this out. Whereas men get it back. So, oh, these reviewers have no idea what they're talking about. I'm sending it on to the next journal. And that's a stereotype. But I think it's been found in research that that's how it works. And so how much if, so I'm not saying this is new per se, but given that a lot of the rhetoric is about how it's new because now it's letting everybody have their say, I think we need to be conscious of the fact that, in fact, it's not. Um, and I would also say that the whole preference idea, yeah, I mean, people have preferences, for sure. But I do think that part of that is actually skill-related as well, as in, do you realize that you can do it in a way that you can still keep safe, or stay safe, or stay anonymous? Or, so I think the whole idea of preference and skill actually intertwine quite a bit. You had your hand up, I think. Oh, no, you didn't? Yes. OK, yes. Mm. As well as, I mean, the digital native thing, but also in general. Sure. So the question is, if I've, have I looked at any credibility studies? And we have a paper on credibility of the, we actually, I don't report on the data about, we did in-person observations and interviews with 102 UIC students and 109 Northwestern students where we met with them one-on-one. -on -one. And we have a paper called Trust Online where we analyze a lot of that data. and. We haven't, so it's much more qualitative, and we haven't done it by gender or other factors, but we find that um, there's a ton of trust in search engines. Um, and it's interesting because traditionally that research looks at, ha does experiments of showing people mock websites, like, oh, what is it, what feature of the website is it that's really important when you're trying to figure out if it's credible? But in fact, what we found was that it's how you got to the first website in the first place that determines a lot of your uh, feelings of credibility about it. So if, well, Google ranked it as one, of course it's credible, which, you know, for those of you who know how Google works, you know that that's not how Google ranks them. So that's a faulty uh, conclusion there. Um, so yes, we have done some of that, but not in that systematic way. It's another area that's really hard to measure quantitatively. And we did replicate some prior survey measures in that study that don't line up with the qualitative findings at all. So it suggests that the survey content from this area is, is pretty tricky. Uh, you had your hand up, Carrie. Um, so, when you're studying uh, <coughs> skill level or savviness, um, how do you judge the level of skill that you're Yes, so the question is, how do we keep up with the times, basically? So how do we change what counts as skilled over time when features change, new things come in, 
old things that might have mattered 10 years ago don't really matter anymore? Very good question. Um, I first just want to point to this paper that's coming out in 2012, but anyway, it's already available on, the web, on my website, um, where we've actually taken data from 07, data from 09, data from 10, the FCC data, and one more study that also replicated um, these measures to show that most of them are actually remarkably consistent over time. So that's one answer, that in fact, they're more consistent over time than they might seem. One thing we do find is that there are a few things, very few things, like two or three of the 27, that do actually change. And those are linked to certain services that really took off. So tagging, which has become a really big deal in fa on Facebook with photos, people understand better. When, we, when I first ask on, a o, on an 06 survey, which is actually where I first used these, that's not what tagging was about. That was about more just systematically tagging articles or whatnot. Um, so that sort of, that took off. And then another was tabbed browsing, which back in 07, browsers, not, that was not very common, and by now it's quite common, so people understand much better. But other than those few examples of things that people understand much better, there's not much change. Now, in terms of how do we keep up with the new, that's a very good question. And I, I just try to, um, I mean, we're actually doing a study now where we're trying to implement social media specific skill measures um, because these are new things and they're not really on the, on the index. And it's come to a point where I, uh, we're actually doing separate small studies first to figure out what works well, and then we'll implement them on the big ones. But it's absolutely right that we need to keep up with the times. Partly what happens is the variation remains over time because while people catch up maybe with the older things, things that have been around, there's always the new thing, right? There's, you can always be the super, sa super savvy person who knows the latest thing, and we want to be able to account for that. I know some other people had their hands up, but I don't know if, did you still want to say something? Or? Sure, the YouTube one. And most of most of those creation things require an additional. Oh wait, login. sorry, an additional uh, what? Login usually. If sure. You do a review on Amazon. Yes. If you're signed in, you have to go and sign in again. If you're going to vote for something, mm -hmm. to, you have to go and sign in again. And it just got me thinking about why I don't do those things. And I consider myself very skilled and very impatient. And so it's, you're saying it's impatience? Well, I'm just wondering <laughs> to what degree in trying to decide if that's preference or arrogance or I have other avenues where I can get my voice heard. I mean, it just, it, it, I'm not sure that I, I think I came up with like five different things mm -hmm. between skill and preference that I don't know how you would test, but have you ever sure. been to any of those? Sure, yeah, so the, the question is, again, questioning whether is it really skill that people participate in these activities or is it something else, for example, arrogance or the ability to be heard somewhere else or and it requires a login to use these and so is it an impatience thing and so what are the alternatives and have I tested for these? So, um, in fact, I've tried to come get at other things. Uh, um, one of the things that I'm interested in thinking about what might be going on is this issue of um, feeling safe, partly because I think especially with women, partly because of, again, what we hear that, you know, the, the internet's a scary place, and so should we be scared about being tracked and um, stalked and who knows what? And so we hear a lot about that, so is that affecting women versus men or girls and boys differently? So I, that's something I'm trying to get at, and I've collected some data with respect to technology use in the home while these students were growing up. So rules that their parents imposed on them with respect to the technology. So that's one area I'm interested in. Um, another one is how, how do people, um, are people put off by the, the negative, com so we know that in all, in many anonymous online settings, there are lots of rude and mean commenters. And so again, another hypothesis is that maybe women are put off that by more, more than men are, and maybe that makes them less likely to participate. It's a possibility. So I've tried to get at that. Again, pretty hard to do with survey questions, so I'm still working with that. Um, although, I, I mean, there are differences I'm finding. They don't seem to be linked to these outcomes, though. So in that sense, it doesn't seem to be working. 
But I think, I mean, partly I think there's room for qualitative work here to get deeper at what's going on. Um, oh, and then one more thing we have data on that I'm about to start um, exploring with Eden Lit is we have information on, on whether, not for these questions, but a whole set of other questions about video and music and your writing and photography sharing, whether you share it privately versus publicly. And I think that might help us get at some of this. Like if women are in fact sharing privately but not publicly, then I think that might signal that it is some of these issues that I just listed. So we're going to test that now with some of the data. Next. Lisa. <laughs> but that's not me either. Right, exactly. My question was more about the role of unpaid labor in this mm. and how that has to do with SDS. Um, you know, unpaid labor is work that you, know, you have to be able to afford to do. And so I don't know if it's something you could even clearly more at all, but is this also a function of leisure time that these are in some ways all elected activities that are work? It's not just expertise. Excellent question. So let me see if I can summarize the initial comment for the microphone. So the comment was that um, this is interesting because it goes against this idea that the web is all about meritocracy um, when in fact uh, it's not such a simple story. And I'm not, I'm not saying this nearly as nicely as Lisa did. Um, in fact, I feel like I'm missing your main point of that. But that in some ways it's recreating like, oh, that students see Wikipedia as the truth, but in fact, it's just a lot of male voices. And um, so th in some ways, some of this is very much recreating differences we saw before. Um, and then the question had to do with a lot of this content creation is in fact a form of unpaid labor and that you have to be able to afford to spend some time on something that you're not being compensated for. And so again, we see that that would suggest um, that uh, it's the people who can afford to have leisure time to be doing these things who don't, who are not busy with childcare, who are not busy with their extra job or whatnot. So here I'm channeling Lisa Nakamura. Um, so uh, my response, I, I think it's an excellent comment. Um, statistically speaking, we could control for some of this because we actually have some data on whether students have jobs on the side. Um, I think you're absolutely right, though. Uh, I think it, uh, so it, I'm reminded of, there was an article in the New York Times a couple of days ago about unpaid internships, <laughs> which is, that's what this reminds me of, right? So it's the really privileged who can afford to spend a year in an unpaid internship because, well, they don't need to make money to get a place in New York to live during that year, right? So that's not exactly egalitarian internship opportunity. And so that, just your comment reminded me of that, that if you, can, you know, if you can afford to hang out online for many hours that it takes to edit Wikipedia entries or upload those 20 videos or whatnot, then you'll be more likely to contribute. And so that might actually be explaining some of the socioeconomic differences, that if you're working 20 hours a week to keep yourself in college, you're less likely to be hanging out online and doing these things. So I think that's an excellent point, definitely. Yes? Um, I just wanted you to um, catch back Oh.
where, where he was going with that particular point, but I thought it was an interesting way, like it kind of got lost in everything else that he was saying. Right? Sure. So um, the question was basically if I could clarify what I was saying here with respect to the slide uh, and ultimately where was I going with it with respect to people's web access on the phone. And um, so we have a whole paper on this uh, where we talk about, it's the same data set, uh, different phone features that people have uh, and use. So partly what's available to them <coughs> and then what are they actually using. And so one of the phone features is to use it to to surf the web, right? And so what we found was that we have data on what we call autonomy of internet use, which is a measure of, of 11 different types of locations. Where can you have access to the internet if you wanted to? Including your dorm room or home, uh, lab, um, library, community center, wireless, like we have 11 things. So we have a measure, which we call autonomy, and so Basically, the idea there is what we found here was that those who had more autonomy, that is, already had more access points to the web, were also those who were more likely to have a phone on which they accessed the web. And so where I was going with this is that, in fact, it's those who are already quite privileged with their access who also have this mobile access through their phones meaning that it's the ones who are already privileged in that sense who have yet this one more layer of privilege now. So cost wouldn't necessarily have anything to do with it? Is that what, if I'm hearing you correctly? It could have to do with it. In fact, it probably does because it's probably the ones who can afford to have all those other things more who also afford this now. And I, I see it as, again, another way that inequality gets perpetuated because it's those who already have these different points of access who have this one more access as well. Christian. Thank you so much for this uh, wonderful presentation. I had um, a, a question um, that's more speculative. Um, I was looking at your measures of skill and the conceptualization of skill, and it reminded me uh, that you wrote a piece some time ago comparing um, the internet to really early communication technologies. Um, and the reason I thought of that is I thought, gosh, you know, all of the <coughs> measures of skill are often really normatively loaded. Like, for example, civic engagement is something we're supposed to do because it's good for us. It's like the internet, eat your vegetables. Um, some of the other measures of skill are loaded in the opposite way. Like some of the things that people do with video online, like porn, um, or some of the things that people do on YouTube are not seen as necessarily positive, unless you're Henry Jenkins, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> so. My question, though, is that if we look at other communication media, you know that in the history of, I know you know this, but in the history of like the telephone, there was this big debate about whether. You should turn your should mic on, by the way, so that would. <laughs> in the history of the telephone, there was this big debate about whether women should be allowed to use it because they were just going to talk frivolously. And men, on the other hand, were, right. were seen as like, well, that's the important use of it because it's for business. And then the, the television was initially referred to, although it's so hard to believe this. It was referred to as the education machine, right? And so we know that over time, the, the hopes we had for it were replaced by some other thing. And so I know you're responding to this rhetoric about digital natives, but I wonder, have you thought of crossing your skills with some idea about what we normatively want to do? Because a lot of your assumptions seem to be really about these positive benefits of the internet, whereas another way of thinking about it would be, you know, people like to watch laughing babies and mm -hmm. you know dancing weird guys and that might be what the internet turns into right mm -hmm. so right and so cats. and laughing cats yes yeah. and, yes that's right and turtles, turtles. um okay so do, should i repeat that one it was a great analogy to, historically to other um uh technologies and communication media where we had high hopes and then it turns out that people use them differently than we necessarily hoped and what does this imply for skill. Um, and that there's an assumption here that it's good to have internet skill and what can come of that and what if it all turns out into just laughing. Or that a lot of the skills you measure are good skills, like they're really, some of, some of them maybe not, but most of them seem like Yeah, really I mean actually positive. I think the, the it's, a, it's, a, it's a really neat question. Um, I think Partly the skills I measure are actually, or what I'm trying to measure 
is that you'll be able to, that people be able to use the internet whatever way they want to, right? Effectively and efficiently for their needs and interests. So I'm actually pretty agnostic as to what that might be. Um, then I link this to skill is a part of the path here, right? Because then I link it all to, well, what are you actually doing online? And is what you're doing online something you can benefit from? Now that gets really tricky because, so um, Paul DiMaggio and I had a piece where we were talking about capital enhancing uses and, and recreational uses. And then I had a place, uh, piece with Amanda Hinnant on that. And then we started getting some critiques that like, who are you to say what's capital enhancing? And who are you to say that that's recreational and not useful? And it's a good point. If you're a farmer, knowing the weather is really important, right? If you make really good sports bets and that's a main source of your income, then I guess following sports could be really important, right? So you could probably make an argument for almost anything that it actually has valuable outcomes for a person depending on their disposition. So then I started looking more at <coughs> diversity of uses, for example, assuming that diverse types of uses are more likely to result in benefits. Um, which is, by the way, linked to skill and the other um, um, independent variables I've been looking at. So I think it's part of the puzzle. And I think it may well be that people end up just using it for entertainment purposes. The little we have on this shows that the people who use it for those more potentially capital enhancing, enriching activities are the ones who are more skilled. and so. There is that link. Now, who, again, who am I to say what's the, what's the activity you can benefit from? That's a legitimate question. I mean, so what you're hypothesizing is that the more laughing babies you watch, like if you get really good That's at... That's not diversity, no. No, but I mean, if you're really good at a package of skills that may not be particularly capital enhancing, that could lead to capital enhancing skills. Is, is that... That's not what I was saying, actually. Okay. Sorry, I wasn't clear. Um, I was saying, well, one, I was saying that, um, or the, I guess, diversity of uses means you're looking at laughing cats, and you're also looking at politics, and you're looking at job opportunities, and those are more diverse things. If you're only looking at cats, not clear that that's really going to lead to much. Turns out the people who do the more things are the more skilled. And by the way, I mean, no one's asked about this, but of course this goes both ways, right? Like the more you do, probably the more skilled you get. So there's also where longitudinal data, data are important. But um, I mean, I think it's a, it's a great question. I also think uh, there's, a, just since you mentioned those less socially desirable activities, in fact, I mean, partly I think what's going on is that some may be desirable in certain ways that we don't think about. So someone once suggested that the gender variation may partly be that men are actually more likely to engage in some of those undesirable activities. Because they're socially undesirable, they learn how to hide their tracks. And so that's a way that they improve their skills. And so in fact, it may be that it's some of the undesirable activities that in fact lead you to be more skilled, and then you can apply that elsewhere. Which is that, a really interesting idea. That's going on Twitter right now. <laughs> <laughs> OK, anyone else? Any questions? Yes? Um, well, uh, this is a very sort of basic question, I think. And it's probably so basic. But it's sort of worried that I'm probably the only one in, the, in this room that I don't know about this. But um, in, the, in the beginning um, of your presentation, you mentioned um, that digital na natives is the one that So it's Mark Prensky, and it's, I think, a 2001 piece, maybe in On the Horizon. If you look, if you look up the term, it'll lead you to him. Um, it was not, I'm not, the venue was not, I don't think it was a scholarly venue. I mean, this is a, someone, he's a public speaker. I think that's his, what he does. So that, I, are you asking me where he got this? I, I'm afraid I don't know because it wasn't, I mean, it's not that it was based on studies or anything it's like that. It's Prensky, P R E N S K Y. Amy.
So the question is whether there's any, so why, why does this rhetoric continue when we now have evidence, and to be fair, others have found this now too, um, uh, internationally, and um, why, is there some benefit to continuing this assumption? And it's a very good question. I mean, I think there's fascination with the new, and I think a lot of the people writing about it are um, not so much the digital natives at this point, although presumably at some point it will be. Um, and so it's just this us, them, and um, I, I don't know why people perpetuate this. I think anything for that great story, why that's the great story, I'm not sure, but there are lots of other things that the media do that I'm not sure about, so I'm, <laughs> I'm probably not the right person to answer that one. Anyone else? Well, thank you. Those were some great questions. So thank our speaker. Thank you.